Well, hey, church family. Uh, as many of you can recall, this past week has been a Sabbath rest week for us as a staff. And in order to do that, we uh, recorded uh, this sermon, this weekend sermon last week, so that we can fully detach and engage into rest. And uh, But I'm sure you're aware that as we rested, that rest has no doubt been disturbed. Uh, I've been disturbed by the fallenness, brokenness, and pain in our world and in our hearts. And uh, regardless of a Sabbath rest or not, we feel it is necessary for us, um, for me as your pastor, to speak into this present moment for all of us. Um, as I do, um, I put before you that I am coming to you in really many different layers. I'm coming to you as a black man who has spent a time weeping and wrestling, has who have vacillated between being overwhelmed and numb, and who have had to be reminded that I have dignity. I come to you as a Christian, a Christian who has wrapped it was wrapped up in this global movement of the church whose savior and leader has called us who where history shows us that this movement has always leaned in and been for the vulnerable and the oppressed i come as a pastor who is called to joyfully and sacrificially give my life to serving and shepherding each and every one of you. And that's you who are vulnerable and, press or, and oppressed or you who uh, will remain dismissive and indifferent regarding acts of injustice, especially those, including those involving people of color. No matter where you're at, I know my call uh, is to lead and shepherd and pastor you. So I come hoping to have all of us find some of our footing um, in this. Uh, this past week, the news cycle and many of our hearts and minds were bombarded with images and scenes of violence, injustice, and human brokenness. Uh, the flames of tension and historic injustice have moved from their heart and has uh, spread into the streets, has spread into buildings and communities. We watch as violence breeds violence and fear breeds fear and destruction breeds destruction. Like Ahmaud Arbery and the many who have come before him, George Floyd became a hashtag this week. His life was taken by someone whose job and obligation was to serve and protect. And whether you have witnessed the video or not, it has no doubt affected Miss many of us and most of us, and we grieve the taking of his life. We grieve a system and a culture where a civil servant can be filmed while enacting brutality without any intervention. We grieve the condition of a human heart that could ignore the cries of desperation from another image bearer. Church, our hearts are broken. Yet in a whole nother headline, in a different part of our country, Christian Cooper could have been a hashtag had circumstances been different. Yet Amy Cooper instead is on the receiving end of a public outcry because of her racist acts, where she sought to misuse her privilege solely based on race. When we witness that and those realities of George and Christian Cooper, they are not detached. And so with that, we still grieve. We grieve the fear and bias and unrighteous anger that justifies such a dangerous abuse of privilege. We grieve that our societal response to that is to distance ourselves from her while thinking, how could she? While thinking we would never do that. And we pat ourselves on and back, not realizing, not taking a moment to consider what lies in her, lies in each and every one of us. We grieve that racism and injustice 
It's like a virus that continues to multiply and spread and take root and destroy individuals and communities. And unfortunately, um, our response as a culture, but definitely as a church, has often been superficial at best and absent at worst. And often uh, we come with the question, well, what do we then do? I have gotten those calls, uh, those texts. So here's a few things that I want to put before us as Christians to do. And I am specifically speaking to us as Christians. First, we lament. You have often heard us say that it never becomes obsolete. We feel the pain and the gap of injustice. And we, we, we lean into being reserved and measured in our sprint to action because too fast of a sprint can undermine the depth of pain the Lord would have you feel. The Lord, for some of us, is developing and growing empathy for the vulnerable and the, and the oppressed. And for those of us who don't feel that, we should ask God to help us feel that. We must lament. We as Christians are called to lament, to sit in the gap of what, what would be if, if sin and brokenness did not exist compared to what is. Next, we lean in. Our temptation, no matter our vantage point, will be to look away, to wait until the headlines change. No matter the media's intention, God allows certain things to cross our gaze for our good and his glory. So as you see images and headlines and hashtags, your goal should not be to look away, but to lean in and ask, what is God what is God showing me, teaching me, revealing to me? Don't be indifferent when God is calling you to lean in and look. Don't be indifferent when God is calling you to lean in and act. The believer is called to pursue righteousness. And people of God, righteousness is always connected to justice. We are called to pursue both. So we lean in. Next, we look in the mirror. Each and every person in these stories bears the image of God. And each and every person in these stories are marred by sin. So as you come across a headline in a story, whose story do you most identify with? Whose story stirs and activates your compassion? See, as Jesus followers, we must be willing to see ourselves both as the oppressed and the oppressor. Because no matter what, whether in past, present, or future, both of these positions define us. So we look in the mirror, and we look in the mirror and we repent and acknowledge those realities. Next, we learn out loud. As Christ followers, we, we are called to be marked by courage and humility. We, we are marked by courage to, we speak privately and publicly, yet humbly we do so. We do so because while we can express our convictions against something, we also must humbly admit when we are confused, when we are outraged, we must humbly admit when we have areas of indifference, areas of frustration, areas of bias, and even hypocrisy. We humbly and we courageously seek understanding, ask questions, and we listen. When we don't, when we're not honest and humble, we lose credibility and trust. And hear me, people, those outside of the church should not be more bold and humble than us. They shouldn't be louder. They shouldn't be more honest with their lack of understanding. We as a church bears the mark of Jesus. We have been giving all the spiritual nutrients and resources needed to live in that tension. So we lean in and we learn out loud, giving ourselves to repentance asking the questions, is it I? And we sit silently, allowing the Lord to reveal the areas in our hearts where it is us. 
We next live out loud. We live beyond our words. Your convictions cannot remain a tweet or a Facebook status, but must move beyond to motivations and actions. Each of us must ask ourselves how much of our lives looks like Jesus. This Jesus that we worship and give ourselves to was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. He risked reputation. He sacrificed his comfort and his safety. He was close to the broken, to the vulnerable, to the forgotten, and they found safety in him. Does this describe you? Does this describe your family? Church, does this describe us? Like, are we willing to take risk, to be ridiculed, to give of ourselves for the vulnerable? Are you willing to speak for those who have no voice, like Proverbs 31, 8 tells us we should be? Are you willing to do so when the headlines and the hashtags move on? See, this moment will pass. Ferguson passed. And many of us, we passed when the headlines ended and the hashtag stopped. But this area, this moment is showing us that when injustice shows its head, it's always been existing under the surface. So we must not ever stop leaning in learning out loud, and living out loud with the passions of Christ. And then lastly, we leverage our privilege for others, whether based on gender, race, education, gifts, resources, personality, or position. Each of us possess privilege granted to us by society. We each have access and abilities that allow us to be more effective in some environments than others. So the question is never whether you have privilege. What is your privilege? Where does your voice carry weight? Where does your influence produce change? How is your privilege to protect those without it? See, identify those who you're called to leverage your privilege for, to give it away, and to spend energy doing that. See, as you do all these things, we do so not in the simple fact that by doing so, we will affect change. We do so because we know we've been filled with the Spirit of God. And we do these things, we are aligning ourselves with the call and the passions of God. And He will pour His Spirit and His grace upon our seeds of effort and bring increase that we desperately seek, need, and pray for. Church, um, my heart breaks for this moment, this pain. But may we be reminded that this moment, this present moment may pass, but the reality of pain and injustice and the reality of racism and the reality of the forgotten and the vulnerable and the oppressed not being leaned into will not leave. So neither should we. I love you.